what this conversation is about is about creating a society as exceptional as we can imagine. All scales, all sectors, fully embodied, not just the idea of the pattern, but the actual thing. It's about creating a society as exceptional as we can imagine. Some people call that heaven on earth. We call that an all-win world. A world in which we've created the systems and structures that indeed enable everyone to win. I'll keep my story extremely short, my personal story. Um, grew up in America, grew up in a Republican background household, uh, grew up in a very Christian household, was definitely hip on the American exceptionalism thing, right? America, best thing that ever happened in the world, right? And, um, and then I simultaneously devoted to um, creating a world that was as close to the myth of heaven on earth as my religion taught me to conceive of. So I looked out in the world and I saw the biggest problem was extreme poverty in Africa. So I went to Africa and I studied international security and conflict resolution, graduated in that, formed a nonprofit organization and lived in rural areas in Africa doing comprehensive community development programs for several years. I really loved that work. And um, we did good work as an organization. But little by little, I started to realize that poverty wasn't just this like thing where some people hadn't quite caught up yet, and if we could just help them catch up to the developed world, then we'd all be good, which is the simplistic frame I had at the time. But it was actually very challenging and confronting to start to better understand that there were geopolitical systems in our world that were actually creating extreme poverty as an output. And not only that, but many of the other very, very challenging issues and problems of our world are actually outputs of the system that we as humans have created on Earth at scale. And that was hard because I loved America. And then I realized that America was part of the problem, a major driver. And for the last 15 years, I've been trying to reconcile that. Am I, am I proud to be an American? Am I ashamed to be an American? Am I both? Can I be both? What's that all about? And I've, I've reflected a lot on these founding principles of America, these words from the founding documents. And through a beautiful conversation with Connie, she brought me into this, this concept of the original promise of America. Mm -hmm. We think about America, we think about freedom. And a lot of times we think about the idea of being free and being able to like, you know, not be controlled by a monarchy and things like that. But she helped me to, to, to initiate me into a more profound realization that it's not the promise of freedom as a concept, it's a promise of freedom as a, as a felt experience, right? The original promise of America is to feel free. And but freedom's not actually quite good enough because freedom is this word that's kind of polarized from being caged up. So you're free in relationship to something that you weren't free. There's a deeper word, and the founders knew this word. It's liberty. Mm -hmm. Liberty isn't just having gotten free from something. Liberty is the felt experience mm -hmm. of knowing that you have choice. And so this notion of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, were these notions that I've... I've ruminated on and reminisced on and strive to integrate how these principles that seem so beautiful would create a country and a world where there was still so much suffering, so much pain, so much subjugation, 
so much destruction. And what Connie helped me to realize and remember is that we are still in the process of fulfilling that original promise. It's in route. We're growing up, we're learning about what creates liberty. And we're learning about what takes liberty away. We're learning a lot of lessons in the last 300 years. And we have the opportunity to look at those lessons and say, that's the bad thing, that's the wrong thing. Look at all these things that happened that shouldn't have happened. That's fair, you're welcome to that perspective. The perspective that I choose to take is these are all ways that we've learned lessons about what creates liberty and what doesn't. And now is our moment in time, if we choose, to reconnect that original promise and reclaim it and rebirth it as the founding fathers and the founding mothers of the next epoch, the next era of America, where we say, let's come back to the drawing board on liberty and let's see what we can do when you integrate all of the lessons learned and all that's available to us today as one nation. And in, in ruminating and considering this concept of liberty, there's one more concept, one more word that's clicked in for me a little bit deeper. And that's what I wanna bring forward today is the core share. What I started to see is that liberty is that experience of knowing that you have choice. But the fully embodied expression of living each day, each moment, knowing that you always have choice, that's sovereignty. And so what we're actually talking about is human sovereignty. What we're actually talking about is below the promise of freedom and the promise of liberty. The original promise is the experience of human sovereignty. People, individuals, communities, collectives at all scales, knowing and living into the free choice they have to live the life they want to live and create the world they want to create. There's a Confucius uh, saying, allegedly, says that when words have lost their meaning, people will lose their liberty. What do you think he was saying? When words have lost their meaning, people will lose their liberty. There's one word I don't want to put in the microscope for a second, and that word is politics. I've asked a lot of people, what does the word politics mean to you? You get the same set of connotations, right? Deceit, hypocrisy, vying for power, money, greed, always the same list. Well, that's not what the word politics means. It's the connotations that we describe to that word as we've looked out at government, and that's what we've seen. But in that process, we've lost the meaning of the word. When you look back at politics, it comes from the Greek word polis. Polis means city, it means my city. It means the place that I call home. Politics means that I love my home and I care about the place that I call home and the people and the living environment that I share that home with, that I'm willing to step up. I'm willing to play some role in collective action to be able to help to steward the place that I call home, to make that place even more beautiful and to protect it for my children and all children for all generations. That's politics. It is a profound word. It's a profound incantation. 
And so when we say that one nation is a political party, we're saying it's a network of people who love this place that we call home so deeply that we're willing and inspired to step up and to find our role of action and leadership, to serve it, to help it to be more beautiful, and to protect it for the generations to come. And so when I reflect upon that quote, when words have lost their meaning, people have lost their liberty. And I think about politics and what a powerful word that is. And I'm starting to get what Confucius was saying. There's another word, republic. The etymology of republic goes back to concern for the people. Concern for the people. What a powerful concept, right? Could be, because in monarchies, power is given by lineage. And in theocracies, power is given by divine right. But in a republic, power comes because the people are concerned for the people. The power and the legitimacy to rule in a republic doesn't come from lineage or from divine right. It comes from the people. This is our world. This is our nation. This is our republic. And this ultimate conversation is how we, as political agents, devoted to this place that we call home, step up in concern for the people to lead our republic as exceptionally as we can. When I tap into my political nature, the part of me that wants to bring my leadership in the world, then I want to create a world where all people are able to experience their sovereignty. So my expression of politics is finding my own sovereignty and seeing if there's anything I could do in my life to be able to lay out that pattern and create space and context for others to find their sovereignty as well. However, due to some of these lessons that we've learned, over the last 300 years. We've learned a lot of ways that people can take away sovereignty. We've learned about how short-sightedness or greed or misguidedness or fear can lead some to infringe upon the sovereignty of others. We see at the center of that conversation is manipulation. It's actually controlling what people think and creating systems and structures to have people stop thinking for themselves. We've seen that the health, the sovereign health of humans has been deeply compromised. We can talk about food, we can talk about health systems, we can talk a lot of other issues that have compromised the vital, thriving health of our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, our children, our neighbors, and all people. We look at addiction, and we look at the way that addiction has been used in order to take away people's sovereignty. And we look out the world today, and we see Expressions of lives being destroyed by addiction and by the inability to find a person's sovereign path in life. We can look at a lot of other facets, debt, finances, work, and see that we've created a lot of systems and structures that haven't done a very good job of protecting human sovereignty. And in fact, there's been deep 
systemic drives to subjugate, to control, and to push people down. And we too have played a role in limiting ourselves in the fears that we live in, the beliefs we live in, the choice that we make. So it's a two-way street. And so when we look at this conversation around politics and around sovereignty, we are totally outside of the realm of incremental change, right? There's not some tweak. There's not a little policy here, a little budget allocation there, a new program here. This becomes legal, that doesn't become legal. There's not a little tweak that's gonna get us out of the systemic drivers that have been undermining human sovereignty. Um, a lot of my mentors have helped me to understand what we call systemic transformation or systems change. The only thing for us to be thinking about is everything, right? The only thing for us to be thinking about is a massively complex, million faceted system that we've created for ourselves. So how do we look at that? How do we think about systemic transformation? How do we integrate this conversation of systemic transformation with a conversation about American politics? What's this all about? What's our role in it? Is it possible? Is it too entrenched? Is the rat nest too tied? Should we give up? Should we let it go? I would say that now is the time for us to rise and act. I don't know if we can unwind the rat's nest but I'm willing to devote my entire life to the possibility of it. And One Nation is an invitation for you to join that process, to join a theory of change that's designed to get at the roots of the systemic challenges, to rebirth ourselves, our communities, our industries, and our nation. This is a multi-decade commitment to go through a real long, tight, messy birth canal together. You know, before there was an America, there was a group of people who envisioned there being an America. And before there was an Apollo mission, there was a group of people who believed we put a man on the moon. Before we're going to have a world that works for everybody, before we're going to have a world that's designed to support human thriving and human sovereignty, we're going to have a group of people who together believe that that's possible. And that like the efforts gone into the foundation of this country or the efforts gone into the, the Apollo missions, that those same people are willing to bring their action, bring their energy, bring their resource, bring their social credibility, bring their risk forward. And I would say that with enough devoted people in relationship with direction, organization, and coordination, around the country and around the world simultaneously with a multi-decade commitment, we can in fact create the exceptional society we feel in our hearts and see in our imaginations. And One Nation is a place for that aggregation to start to occur. It's a place for us to find each other. It's a place for us to find the texture of our interactions, our relationship, and our synergy. It's a place to organize. It's a place to come together as not only one nation of Americans, but one nation of, 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 of mothers and fathers of the future. One nation of future ancestors coming together saying, now is the time, we are the ones, 
and let's see what's possible when we join genius and bring all the blueprints that we carry together in service to inventing and building and inhabiting the most exceptional society possible. <clears throat> and this conversation around sovereignty speaks not only to the sovereignty of people, but the United States, United States, in that foundational origin, spoke to sovereignty. It spoke to the sovereignty of the states. The federal government was just a loose container to help to defend the borders and help the states work together, but it was the sovereignty of the subcomponents that this was all about. And below that, there was the sovereignty of the communities. That's what it was all about. And over the course of the last couple hundred years, we've learned some lessons about how vying for power can lead to a concentration of power, which can start to rob the sovereignty of communities and states. So this conversation too is about the sovereignty of the parts. This is one nation, but it's also 50 states. And it's also thousands and thousands of communities and cities. And now is the time in this rebirth process for us to put the community first, the region second, and the national context for organization as a support to the sovereignty of those things. We can do this. What's interesting and inspiring to me, and, and slightly counterintuitive, is that sovereignty requires some kind of unity to be able to experience it, right? So with all this talk of sovereignty, it doesn't mean we all just run in different directions. Again, the United States, right? So we had to come together as a pre-nation in order to experience the sovereignty of the new nation. To even birth the original promise of a nation that generated sovereignty for its citizens. So there's this relationship between unity and sovereignty simultaneously. And one nation is a container and a context for us to experience that unity. And it's not only a unity for us, it's modeling a unity for our nation and for our world. Because our nation has been split up on purpose. We've got a left, we've got a right conservatives and progressives. We have 99% and 1%. We have different races. We have all these different ways that we've been cut up, we've cut ourselves up. And we have different political factions, different political organizations representing heart. And so this isn't only a call for the unification of those of us in this room, but what would it take to have a party for the 100%. And who do we have to be to be that? What do we need to let go of, right? Who are we certain is the bad guy? Who are we certain is worthy of our judgment? Who do we withhold our empathy from? Who do we look out in the world and say, yeah, they're not worthy of dignity because I just know that they're rotten to the core, right? So we all get to realize how one nation isn't fully embodied within ourselves. And it's an invitation for us to actually wrap the wings of our love and our care around every single person. And so in that process of unity, some people call it unity consciousness, we start to create the, the energy 
from finding each other to the creativity of inventing the unprecedented. And there's an oversimplification when we're in that us, them, win, lose mentality, because we get into our opinions and we know who the bad guy is. And our primary aim in that polarized narrative isn't to be creative. It's to make sure that the bad guy doesn't win. It's to make sure that whoever we've defined as other doesn't win. And so this is a reclamation of all of that energy away from the fight of us versus them, good and bad, right and wrong. That checkerboard duality that has come to define most of our thinking and use that commitment to be all inclusive, to raise our own consciousness into a place that we call the all win paradigm, right? One nation is about choosing an all win world. And I believe there's nothing short of including all in our circle of empathy and creativity that will actually enable us to do the thinking, feeling, and doing required to create this exceptional society in which I speak. I love this notion of inheritance. When we typically hear the term, a lot of times we think about money, or wealth, passed on from one generation to the next. But inheritance, to feel connect that word for a little bit, it's more than that, right? This world, is our inheritance, right? Every aspect of this world that was created by those that went before us who won't be here forever, they give that world to us, right? So the natural environment as children of earth is part of that inheritance. But so too is every sector. Hollywood is our inheritance. The power grids, as they are, are our inheritance. The police force is our inheritance. Government is our inheritance. Government is an artifact. It's something that our ancestors created to create systems and structures of organizing and creating public benefit at scale. Imperfect as it is, it's our inheritance. But whose inheritance ever was perfect in the first place? So who are we as inheritors? Do we shirk that and say, yuck, yuck, dad, that's a little bit dense for my taste. No, thanks. <laughs> or do we say, this is my destiny. My destiny is to receive the city of Boulder, to receive the state of Colorado, to receive the United States of America. This is our inheritance. And so if we can step forward and choose it, stop running from it, if we can hold within ourselves these principles of sovereignty and this paradigm of an all-win world, I absolutely believe, despite the current condition, that over the next couple of decades, we can surprise ourselves with what's possible. I'm in, and we have a growing number of people who are deciding to be in as well every day, right? There's a whole lot of people who aren't fully activated in politics for a bunch of reasons. But now's the time to see, all right, I get it. If you've looked out there and kind of seen the red and blue thing and that kind of turned you off, I get it. If you haven't voted, I get it. If you've never been engaged, I get it. But maybe we can create a context together that we want to engage in. So you don't have to live in that internal conflict 
of do I participate in a system I don't feel aligned with or do I abdicate my participation entirely? No, we can create a context that we're fully aligned with and we can fully reclaim our participation and our leadership in that system. To speak to my generation, the millennials, we are the voting majority. That's right. The baby boomers were the voting majority for a long time. And they made a lot of decisions from policy and who they elected. They used those votes. And the world we see is the world that was created with those votes. What are we going to do with our votes? We're the voting majority. If organized as a generation, growing up in a new world with a new worldview and the paradigm that we carry and that we're sharing with each other, we can decide every shred of policy. We can decide every single election outcome. Every mayor, every city council position, every sheriff, every governor, every president for decades to come. We are the voting majority. That's our inheritance. What are we gonna do with that? Right, the center of that is our willingness to organize, our willingness to say yes, our willingness to stand up and cultivate our leadership, our ability to hold that all-win paradigm so we can run all-win cities and all-win states and an all-win nation. To begin to explore a new generation of policy that's inherently des designed to unite, that's inherently designed to understand the fears that have been on any side of any topic before and the desires that have been on any side and move the quality of the conversation above us, them, right, wrong, good, bad, and actually create a new frame of all win policy that can actually begin to be the instruction manual for the transformation of our society. This policy is already under works and one nation is a political context an emerging block of organizers and voters to help to move that into our cities, states, and nation. So we can put our government to work for us, right? A city's got a billion dollar budget. We've got really big ideas of regenerative agriculture and healing our childhood traumas and, and new energy solutions and new ways of social organizing. Let's use our cities. Let's use our cities to ground the vision of the future that we have to come together to create new blueprints and use the budgets, use the administrative capacities to use the credibility of government to show something new. And as soon as we've got one thing that's working a little bit better, let's share that with every single mayor in the world and say, hey, we did this new thing. We used a little bit of public money. This is how we did it. It worked good, people liked it, and the person got reelected. It's not complicated. You can try that too. And when we look at the world and we say, how the heck do we create transformation at the scale and velocity that we want and need to see it at? I say, put our governments to work, right? When I look at the ecological challenges, pretty much the only thing that gives me hope is the possibility of deploying our militaries and their engineering capacities to regenerate soils, oceans, forests, and air, right? We can do that. We can, we can decide how we use our militaries. We can decide how we use every aspect. And so in conclusion, I think you're starting to get the flavor of what we're here for, what One Nation's all about. One Nation Party USA is a new political party. We're in a proto-party stage, which means that in 2021, we formed the official legal entities in every state that gives us ballot access. So as a political party, as a growing network of people having ballot access, we get to bring a nominee forward for every elected position. In 2022, we have a vision. 
We have a national campaign of a new generation of mayors committed to human sovereignty and create an all-win world. And we're beginning to identify these people and raise them up and help you to identify yourselves and prepare the conditions so that as a growing network, we can run a national campaign and local campaigns all around the country and see how many mayors we can move into office. So we don't have to be outside of city hall with, with our picket signs or trying to influence city council. We just become city council. We just become the mayors and we can start to do that. And every single campaign intrinsically is a PR campaign for the future. Every single campaign is telling a new story of what's possible for that city and the city and the role that city can play in our entire nation and our entire world. So we're really excited about this 2022 national campaign and we just keep rolling every election cycle thereafter. Larger network, more organizers, more voters, more people running for office, real kind of nuts and bolts types of stuff. But we do it with a new level and quality of love, owning our power and bringing the depths of our spirituality incarnate into the world that we're creating. We are launching all of this with a bold, provocative 2020 campaign that we're calling Choosing an All-Win World. And while the entire world is thinking about American politics and wondering if there's, if there's real sanity, if there's real wisdom that's bringing forward an adequate enough set of priorities to be able to navigate us and lead us through the birth canal into a new era of society, that they'll see something new. They'll see a new spark. And how bright that spark is, is up to each of you, of how bold we can be together in 2020. To be able to, to light up our cities, light up stages, light up our media, light up our social media with a new all-win campaign designed to launch one nation party at a national scale and build the exit velocity for us to become a major political vehicle for the future. Thank you very much.